if you'd like to get started copying that. All right, so the first chapter, I guess it was our chapter two, three test. Um, in chapter three, we started learning about chemical quantities, or really, I, I should say measurable quantities, things that we could do calculations, quantitative measurements, that's the term I was looking for, quantitative measure, uh, measurements. And um, so we talked about things like you measure time in seconds, you measure distance in meters or centimeters or millimeters, you measure mass in grams or kilograms. And then we mentioned, even though we didn't test on it, we mentioned that there was a chemistry measurement called the mole. And while that name sounds funny, its root comes from uh, referring to the molecules. Yes, having a calculator, thank you, generally, you're right. Uh, having a calculator out today wouldn't be a bad idea. Um, if you've already sat down, you're afraid you're gonna miss out on something. Um, None of the calculation, uh, nothing that we do today is outside of your calculation skills. Okay, so the things that we already learned how to do with our calculators, you need to practice these though tonight. So if you don't practice in today's uh, examples, make sure that you're doing your homework assignment, you're practicing in your examples. Um, but yes, you do, you uh, would be a good idea to have your calculator uh, working properly. So we mentioned at the beginning of the year that measuring amount of something in chemistry uses the word mole. And, and like I said, it came somewhere, I think one of you actually looked it up and told me that it's, its root comes from molecule. So this isn't stuff that I knew ahead of time. I just have always known that the mole is what we do for counting in chemistry. Uh, the reason for this is because we're dealing with things that are so small that it takes a whole lot of them in order to have enough to add up to anything. It would be like if somebody said to you, um, you know, uh, what is the mass of Tic Tacs in kilograms, right? So one Tic Tac is probably less than a gram. So you would need at least a thousand of them to equal one kilogram. So therefore, if somebody said, what's the mass of Tic Tacs in kilograms, you might say, well, how about if I mass 10,000 of them and that way 10,000 Tic Tacs then actually substantially adds up to a few kilograms. So then you come up with a special name for that. Instead of calling it 10,000 Tic Tacs, you might call it the capital TAC, right? And so you come up with just this name that is grouping together a large number of Tic Tacs. That's exactly what a mole is. It's grouping together 6.02 times 10 to the 23rd particles. And if you look at that, you might go, gosh, that is, an, that is an, an absolutely arbitrary number. Why would you pick six or more than that, 6.02? Why not just round that to like five, five times 10 to the 20th power or something like that? Well, there's reasons for the madness and it has to do with our periodic table. So a uh, periodic table might not be a bad thing to have out as well today while you're working with your calculator because we will be using both. Um, remember that what I've said to you in the past is the stuff that's in red, you don't have to copy down. Um, this, there's a lot of text boxes in this chapter. In fact, if you actually follow along with the chapter notes, you might find that very beneficial compared to listening to me talk because uh, the difference is, is I kind of talk too fast, right? When you guys are copying things down, you're trying to write and you're trying to listen at the same time. and and something escapes you. Whereas in the notes, I broke down each of these examples for the first couple days into multiple, multiple steps so that you can see from page to page on the slides why I did the craziness that I did. So you should consider uh, looking at the notes for this. Um, you want to get this down. Um, I'm going to give you a warning that on this chapter test, I'm probably going to make this chapter test short and I'm going to make this chapter test timed. In other words, when I say to you, okay, here's the test, I'm sending them out right now. 
I'm going to say they're due by a certain time and they're going to start coming in at that time. Um, I'm not waiting for you to go back into your notes and go, okay, so let's see how exactly did Mr. Purser do this from step to step. You need to get this where it becomes just a, a flowing, like you guys are, are doing some kind of martial arts. This has to be something that flows right from you. Every chemistry class in the history of room A102 has done this as a flowing, memorized, they understand the procedure for these problems. Just because you guys are at home doesn't change anything. We are now no longer a, um, a like first quarter chemistry class. We are now a second quarter chemistry class. Um, first of all, these kinds of questions don't have a whole bunch of, of like parts to them. So they're, they're, you'll see how they are right now. So when I, sh when I say short, yeah, probably less than 10 questions. Um, if, there, if the test has anything longer than 10 questions, it would be because there might be some informational questions at the beginning that, you know, like I could ask you, what is the value of one mole? And then you have to tell me 6.02 times 10 to the 23rd. That would be the only kind of thing. I've never had that on my tests in the past. Uh, odds are your test is just going to be like maybe five or six uh, questions that you have to do the calculations on. But you have no idea what I'm talking about right now because you've never seen these calculations. So let's just um, hold off on that and we'll worry more about exactly your test format as we get closer to the actual test. Um, I can tell by emails that I have that there are some scared and hurt feelings that are out there based on um, maybe a test score or whatever as what's going on because you're starting to recognize that your grade is slowly but surely starting to fall into place. Um, I also will point out that I recognize from my side, and this of course is not everybody, in fact I would even say this is not most, um, that the second quarter lull uh, kicked in full force and so some people allowed for chapters six and nine to kind of get out in front of them a little bit and then they had to play catch up and it was a difficult chapter to play catch up in but not impossible. Uh, chapter 10 probably going to consider it pretty impossible to play catch up on. Uh, you want to be able to catch all of these things daily. So uh, don't give me any excuses on, uh, well, I'm sorry, you know, I, I couldn't get to my homework last night because such and such. Why are you waiting to doing the homework so late? Start the homework tonight. So that if something gets in the way, then you have to put it off from tonight. You can then work on it tomorrow night or tomorrow afternoon because you don't want to work on Friday night. Friday nights are supposed to be sacred. Um, but you get what I'm saying is don't wait and don't fall behind because this is a chapter where it will be difficult to try to pull all of it together in one big bolt. It's a lot easier to take this in the small bites that I'm going to give you um, over the next couple days. All right, back to the mole. When we say a mole's worth of particles, it's a good number to use for things that are really small. And I mean, when I say really small, I mean really small, like the size of atoms, the size of molecules, things like that. It's not a good number to use for things like donuts and oranges and Chevrolets. Even grains of sand are too big because <clears throat> it's my understanding, if I can remember with the grain of sand, I think I have some trivias up here on the next slide. Let's wait till we get to that. But we're gonna see that these become massive amounts. When you think of something that you can actually see and you count a mole's worth, you're gonna have just too much. So it doesn't make sense to use that. We would think of, you know, if you were uh, very rich, you might have a dozen Chevrolets. You might have a dozen cars, right? If you go to the store, you buy a dozen oranges. So these are things where a dozen is better. This is a number where we're dealing with really small things where a dozen's too small. So we have a chemistry's dozen, which is called the mole. It's also called Avogadro's number. Why the craziness of the number? You can see that on this slide, everything's pretty much in red. I would almost say that everything could be considered in red here. You don't need any of this information in your notes. There's nothing for you to go back and study from on this slide. All this is, is just to explain why 6.02 times 10 to the 23rd exists. If you take the number 6.02 times 10 to the 23rd, I put a little red star by that. And you take the mass of one single proton, I put a blue, I think I said right, a blue star by that or asterisk by that. If you multiply those two numbers by each other, you get one gram. So what that tells us then is this crazy number allows our periodic table 
remember I said today would be a good day to have it out, allows our periodic table to speak to us in two different ways. It allows it to speak to us in terms of atomic mass units like we already did back in chapter four, but now it also is gonna allow us to speak, it's gonna allow it to speak to us in grams per mole of things as well. So as you can see at the bottom there, when it says one carbon atom has a mass of 12 AMUs. So on your periodic table, we learn there's the 12 right there, if it'll focus on it, not really, but kinda. Um, that 12 was telling us that there were six protons and six neutrons in the nucleus of a carbon atom. Now we can say that if you have a mole's worth of carbon, how much is a mole's worth of carbon? Honestly, probably would be about the size of the end of this pen right there. That's about how much a mole's worth of carbon is. So uh, go buy the Costco size container of pencil leads, take them all out of their containers, hold them all up together, and that probably is about 12 grams, right? Maybe not, maybe you'd have to get like a double Costco size pack of, of pencil leads until you get 12 grams worth. It's not much. Once you have 12 grams worth, you have a mole's worth of carbon. All right, um, it's not very much because atoms are so small, but that number then 12.0 becomes both the AMUs, protons and neutrons, and also becomes a number of grams if you had one mole of a substance, okay? See the connection? Good connection. Um, we use it for counting. I still don't even know that there's really anything that you need to copy down from this slide because the top three bullets, this one already was on the first slide. So it was probably the first bullet. You're never gonna to refer to this anyway. So don't even bother copying down this slide, but there is some good trivia that you can see there. I wanted to do the grains of sand. There it is, number four. If you were to take little tiny grains of sand, go out in your front yard with a pair of tweezers and pick up one grain of sand and look at it. If you had a mole's worth of those, they would completely cover the United States to a depth of about two football fields, okay? That's how many grains of sand. In other words, if you had everybody on earth start counting grains of sand, you can see in uh, number three, Avogadro's number, if you were to count 100 grains of sand every minute, so could you pick up 100 grains of sand in 60 seconds? Probably not. But if you could do that and you did this for 12 hours a day and everybody else on earth did this too, it would take 4 million years for us to finally count up that number of grains of sand. What's the point of all this? It's to tell you that this is an unfathomably large number that we're dealing with here, but we have to deal with an unfathomably large number to offset the fact we're dealing with something that's so unfathomably small, okay? So the two things offset each other. As far as your test goes, no bearing on what you do on your on your test, and yes, that is a long time. Um, I don't know what you know about uh, uh, about time in terms of like the universe. It's believed that the universe, based on background radiation, that the universe is about 10.6 billion years or 13 point, probably 13 something billion years. See, but I'm not in physics mode right now. Um, the Earth has has, uh, I think that single-celled single organisms have been on this earth for about 4 million years. And I saw one time where a person did a uh, explanation of this on Discovery Channel. And they said, if you take your arms, spread out your arms, your wingspan, your full length, and think of that as a timeline, that human beings have been on the surface of the earth for about as wide as the very tip of your fingernail sticks past your finger. I wasn't trying to flip you off, okay? So that's how long human beings have been here compared to the single celled organisms like viruses, like the things that we're dealing with our pandemic. These things have been around a lot, lot longer. And it's really hard to think about that much time because it doesn't, it doesn't make any sense, but that's what geologic time kind of explains. So yes, Esteban, that is a very, very long time. All right, so all of that is great stuff. Good philosophy, good trivia, great things to sit and have discussions about. But what gets your chapter test done in chapter 10 is about knowing how to do conversion tables, okay? We're into a section in chemistry that has the name stoichiometry. You're gonna hear me use that phrase a lot. I like to say stoichiometry because of the fact that the AP chemistry mm -hmm. test likes to throw that word in there too. Stoichiometry is metry, right? Like geometry, trigonometry, 
later on this year, we're going to learn about calorimetry, which is measuring cal uh, calories. Um, this is a measurement of things. And the stoichio is a root or a prefix that must mean something about the, the measurements in chemistry, probably means something with particles. Okay. So don't be bothered by the term stoichiometry. Stoichiometry can be done with formulas, like you would learn a, a formula to solve something. Like we learned a density formula at the beginning of the year, density equals mass over volume. You could use formulas for this as well. Most chemistry teachers don't do that. Most chemistry teachers do what I do. Therefore, I feel more comfortable teaching you what are called conversion tables so that no matter who you end up with in college, next year, somewhere else in time, that you would be speaking the universal language of stoichiometry, which is conversion tables. Now, what a conversion table is, is basically a way for us to change how something looks without changing what it is, okay? So I'm gonna write down some stuff in red that I don't want you to copy down. Let's say that you had the fraction one half and you wanted to change that because let's say that you were talking about a pizza, right? You've got a half a pizza left and your five best friends just came over. And, oh, no, let's not say that. That wouldn't make sense because I'm not going to have it with half. Let's say that your two best friends came over, so there's now three of you there, and you decided to break this up. You can convert one half into three pieces by multiplying it by three over three. When you do that, it becomes three out of six. In other words, if you think about a full pizza, including the slices that aren't there, right, which would be this side of the pizza over here, that you could say one half is equivalent to three sixths. This right here was a conversion factor that changed the denominator of a fraction. Well, chemistry has that too, but ours won't be the same number top and bottom because instead ours are measurements and measurements can have different numbers with them because the unit of the measure allows the numbers to be different. So in other words, 6.02 times 10 to the 23rd particles is the same thing as one mole is really no different than this conversion of three over three. It's just that the numbers are different because the units of measure are different, but they don't change the value of something, okay? Now, that still might not have made sense. That doesn't mean that you can't get a A++ on this chapter test if you follow my simple rules, okay? I'm gonna kind of be like Yoda now, and you're gonna be young Luke Skywalker. And you have to do what I tell you. And sometimes you don't question what I tell you, you just do it, okay? So here's how we do it. First thing is, just like a, a math one teacher would teach us with word problems, is there's a question in here somewhere. How many moles, all right? So what we're gonna do is on the far right-hand side of our paper is we're gonna put question mark and then leave a little space for what that number is. Question mark, moles of magnesium. All right, because a money question is always a great place to start. Let's get rid of our pizza analogy. Then in chemistry problems, pretty much nine times out of 10, and that's an understatement, 99.9 .9 times out of 100, 999 times out of 1,000, whatever number you see in the question is going to be your starting point. So I believe a 99.9, .9, especially with a curve, that's over 100% on a test. So you can take a chance that when you see the number 3.01 times 10 to the 22nd atoms, yes, the units matter. When you see that given in the question, that that would be the place that you start with. And so you can see I put it over here. You might even notice that I kind of put it up high compared to the equal sign. If you didn't do that with yours already, don't worry about it. I've seen plenty of examples with this. Okay, now we could do this as a mathematical formula. Don't copy this down. The formula would say something to the effect of uh, number times moles, which has the uh, symbol as a mathematical symbol, an N over number equals N. That's kind of what the math statement would say that would make this become a formula. 
But we don't want to do that because the problem is, is there's too many different ways that we shake this. And so therefore that formula then just gets warped too many different ways. And it actually makes for a slower process and more stuff in your brain. It's more complex, but you could look at it as a formula. For us, it would be better for us to think instead. Now, okay, before I erase that, let's go back to this. Notice how what I wrote here was that I was going to multiply a number times a fraction that had numbers in the denominator and then that would end up with an answer that came out to be in this unit of moles, n. All right, so I'm gonna do the same thing, but in chemistry, and we saw this back in chapter three, just real quickly, what we do to represent multiplication and division is instead of using the multiply sign and the divide sign, we like to use fraction bars. We call them conversion tables. So we make a really long conversion table line here like so, okay? It's a big line line that goes underneath this. So let me go through the steps of what I've done so far. Number one, I started by writing down the money question. Number two, I wrote down, well, maybe number two is I draw this line since these are all conversion table problems. And then number three, because I drew the line, I can take the very, the given number and put it on the very first part of that conversion table line, okay? So what I've done right here is I basically have put a line underneath this part right here. Okay, and then equals number of moles n. All right, now the next thing I wanna do, and this is where we get into the Yoda analogy, is what conversion tables do for us is they allow us to get out of units. So to get out of the units of atoms, just like a number could cancel out a number in a multiplication like this or division like this, we will put atoms in the denominator a little bit over to the right. In other words, I'm gonna call that the next step in the conversion table. Now by putting atoms down here, that unit will cancel out, just like you could cancel out, if we go back to our fraction analogy from earlier, what if I had uh, said to you, I don't even know what, like let's say if I had you multiply two thirds times one sixth. You guys might, instead of just multiplying two times one is two and three times six is 18, you might have started by learning back in middle school or even maybe elementary school, late elementary school, that you can cancel out a two with a six and reduce it, right? So we know how to do that with fractions. That's what our conversion tables do as well. The units of atoms are going to cancel out, but we got to do something here because we don't want to change the value of this problem. We just want to change what it looks like. So I'm going to get out of atoms and I'm going to get into moles. So what I need is a conversion unit that doesn't change the value of that, just makes it look different. So then I look above and I see there are two conversion unit possibilities. One says six particles over one mole and the other one says one mole over six particles. The way I have it written here, I want the moles on top. So I'm gonna use the second one of these two, put one mole on top. The particular type of particle I'm speaking of right now is an atom. And I'll put the 6.02 times 10 to the 23rd in the denominator. Whew. Don't worry, we don't have to explain them like this every single time, but we do at the beginning. Now, I wanna remind you, units cancel out. So the atoms, will cancel out the atoms. The numbers don't cancel out. I'm just talking about the units of measure right now cancel out. This unit of moles has nothing over here on the left-hand side to cancel it out. It gets to stay. Therefore, it gets to be in our final answer, okay? So what's left? Just like we did up here where we reduce this down with this fraction, two thirds times one sixth. Let's do the same thing with these numbers. Some of you might look at that and go, oh, 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 I see. 3.01 goes into 6.02 exactly two times. In other words, we could reduce this down to one over two. <laughs> Why would we do that? When even Jen, we recognized, we're just gonna use one of these, right? Because it won't always be so easy for us to cancel out the numbers like that. It's gonna be that easy on your test. You know why? Because I'm gonna make 30 versions of this test which means that I've got to make the numbers really easy because I'm not even going to make keys. What I'm going to do is I'm going to set up the problem. I've been doing, I'm, I've been Yoda on this for 30 years now. 
So I want to make the numbers easy that I can just look at your test and go, oh, the answer's got to be one half without even having to go make a key and plug it into a calculator. So odds are it will be this easy, but you might not always notice how easy it is. So just use this and type it in, right? You remember that the button, well, of course, you guys are now using the TI Inspires. You're not using these TI-83s and TI-84s so much. So I probably need to have my Inspire out over here, but I believe for you guys, you had a 10 to the X button that you would put in. So 3.01, I'm gonna go over all of that stuff when we do the homework assignment. Uh, maybe not. Maybe I do need to go over that right now because you might notice something when you get to these notes tonight. You're like, all right, I got a homework assignment. He said to keep up. I'm just going to copy down what he did. Hey, wait a minute. Where's the answers? Yeah, that ship sailed. Some of the answers are there. Most of the answers aren't. I want to start seeing what you guys can do. I don't want to see what I can do. I already know what I can do. I want to see what you can do. So when you turn in a homework assignment, that's just my work. What have, what have we accomplished? We accomplished one thing. I got paid, right? That's, a, that's an important thing. But I didn't take this job just to get paid, right? If I wanted to, to just get paid, I'd be a Walmart greeter. That seems like an easier job, right? But I work here because I like doing what I do. I like showing people what I know. And I want them to be able to take over this job someday and show somebody else what they know. So I need to see what you know. So you won't see as many answers now. So because of that, we need to make sure you can use your calculator because I still don't want you to, to not be able to do this, but I want you to show me that you can do this. Divide those two numbers. I think you get one half, 0.5. I do grade significant digits in this chapter. If I even grade the numbers at all. You know what, the thing is this, is, this is what I'm getting at is when it gets to a problem like this one, I'm gonna make them easy so that I can see what your answer should be. And then I'm going to look at the answer to see that you have the right number of significant digits. Three, right here, three. Whatever was given in the problem, put that many in your answer, okay? So even if your calculator told you exactly 0.5, or if you're still kind of a little bit fresh with your TI Inspire and it's still spitting back to you a fraction, you got to get over that. You got to get over that. Remember we told you that when you, well, it won't do that with this one because they're in scientific notation. But if you had divided uh, one divided by two and your calculator tells you one over two, that all you have to do is type in one divided by two, put a decimal at the end of the two, then your calculator defaults to a decimal answer, okay? Good time, let's try another one. Do you see how much fun I'm having? How many molecules are there in four moles of glucose? Whew. Zen with conversion tables. First thing is, this feels like a math problem. It feels like a problem that involves a conversion table. So I shall, on my test, start by drawing a big long line putting an equal sign, and then putting the money question. Okay, that's a good start. Then, if you're still not sure what to do, I wouldn't know what to do. Take whatever number they gave you in the problem and put it first. Uh, it, writing down the name of the substance here, when they get to be cumbersome like this, if you leave them out, you're not going to hurt my feelings, but we're going to need them when we get to chapter 12. So as your teacher, it's kind of my job that I have to put them, but you have to put the units for sure. I want to see the moles there. If all I see is a four, even if you get the answer right on your chapter test, you're not going to get full credit. The person who shows me the work and gets the answer wrong is going to get more points than the person who does it right and doesn't show me anything. So just plan on it. If it makes you mad, uh, you know, there's my picture on the screen right now. Take a screenshot, print it out, put it on your dartboard and throw darts at it for a while. But just be ready that you're going to have to show your work. I want to see all this. Okay, now we have moles, but we want molecules. So what we do is we get out of the units that are given and we do that by putting them in the bottom on the next step of the conversion table. Then we put the units of what we have as a final answer in the top. Sorry, 
sorry about my writing. For some reason, the pen doesn't show every part of, of the markings that I put on the paper. Whew. Okay, molecules of glucose. Now, just like Luke Skywalker, I don't know what the name of the planet was, like Alderaan or something like that, that he went and visited Yoda in the second episode. I was a little kid when that came out. I remember seeing the first two Star Wars. I was like seven and nine. I remember just staring at the screen in just absolute amazement. I don't know that I caught one part of any story because I, it was there was nothing like that up until that time. So as little kids, we just stared at the screen like, like going, this is the future, right? So like that Skywalker, when he left the planet early, you feel like you could leave the planet early now because some of you are like, oh, I get what he's doing, fine. Well, by next time we meet, this is, gonna, is, is going to falter. And so we have to be prepared that we can't just always fall onto these two steps. But I'm gonna get into that when it's time. Right now, we're still learning some easy basic steps. We need a conversion between moles and molecules. So you look up into your conversions that you have here. This first one puts the moles in the denominator. That's what I did here. So I'm gonna put the one down at the bottom. Notice that the one always follows the moles and the 6.02 always follows the number of particles, which in this case are molecules. So if you put the molecules on top, the 6.02 goes on the top. If you put the molecules in the denominator, the 6.02 goes into the denominator. You don't get to choose. The conversion got to choose. You get to choose which unit you put on top or bottom. That's it. Choose wisely. Moles of glucose cancel out. Molecules of glucose have nothing to cancel them out with. So they get to stay. And now this problem just becomes us typing that into our calculator. Four times six is 24. So you might be thinking to yourself, well, I'm not going to get my calculator out. This is just 24.08 times 10 to the 23rd power. That's fine, but on your chapter test, that might cost you a point. So it'd be better if you just learn how to use your calculator. It's gonna move the decimal over one place. I'm not sure where the point one comes from. I guess I rounded because it would have been 2408 would round to 241, yeah. Three significant digits because this has three significant digits. Next example. Hey, a whole another different kind of thing here. Uh, we still have two sections to cover today. Your first section has two things to cover today. So we really have three things that we're covering today. Uh, Andrea, you are correct. The thing is, is when you take that 2.408 and you round it to three significant digits, sorry, I'm pointing at the chat right now like you guys can actually see the chat. Okay, let me write down what Andrea just asked. 2.408 times 10 to the 24th. If you put that on your test, it's going to cost you one point for significant digits. We only want three in the answer, so we cut this off at three. But we don't just cut it off. We let the eight tell us whether we should round up or round down. In this case, we round that up. Now, if you don't do that on your test, please don't sit there going, oh my God, I'm going to do terrible. You're not going to do terrible. This test is going to have a healthy curve, um, healthier than the last chapter test. I didn't want to curve the last tap, chapter test at all. I expected 100%. But then I saw that I was grading harder than I was getting as answers. So then I was like, okay, a, a curve is fair. Here, this is different because there is no like, there is no interpretation of these problems. They are what they are. You do what you do. Okay. So um, if I take a point off there, the curve is, is really more about the fact that these are hard. This is a new topic and it's hard. And so therefore, you get a curve for this, but you're gonna show me your work. All right. The second thing that we learn how to do is what's called gram formula mass. I never call it that. I always call it molar mass. So maybe one of these days I should actually change my heading of this section to molar mass because I think that's even what I called it when I made the, um, the calendar. So helium. Good old helium. It says 4.0 on your periodic table. Remember, we just talked about this a few minutes ago. What does that 4.0 mean? It means that there are two protons and two neutrons inside the nucleus. We would say then that's a total of four atomic mass units. Carbon has 
six protons and six neutrons, which is a total of 12 atomic mass units. But as we said on the slide that you didn't need to copy down, here's the part where you can have it copied down. If you had a mole's worth of helium, that'd be a big balloon. If you had a mole's worth of carbon, that would be a small piece of like real thick pencil egg. Um, those numbers, sorry, brain painted on you for a moment. Those numbers of a mole's worth are hold true. That a really, really large balloon, I mean, we're talking about like, you know, first of all, helium's hard to weigh, right? I mean, how do you weigh helium? You really technically need to take it into a vacuum because the problem is helium's buoyant. So when you put it in air, it's like standing on a bathroom scale in a, in a pool. If you weighed yourself on a bathroom scale in a pool, it's not going to be accurate, is it? Because you're buoyed up by the water. Well, helium is really buoyed up by the atmosphere. So to weigh out helium is a lot of work, but it can be done in a vacuum for sure. So if you put it into a balloon, what, and you'd have to almost like weigh the vacuum, you'd be, have to be in a bell jar inside of there. You'd have to weigh, eh, I'm getting talking about too much. You'd find out that it weighs 4.0 grams per mole. Okay, for carbon, you could say the carbon, that would easy, because it's a solid, it doesn't float. It weighs 12 grams per mole. Okay, can I write that in a slightly different way? What if I wrote that as 12.0 grams per one mole? All of a sudden, there's people going, hmm, that looks a little bit like a conversion table, right? A conversion step, I should have said. 12 grams of carbon to every one mole. What if we flip this over and said one mole to every 12 grams of carbon, right? Wouldn't this then look like our conversion table Avogadro's number that we just did on the first slide? We could do the same thing with grams and moles. So what we're kind of starting to develop here is a mole is a pretty special thing in chemistry. I'll be honest with you, it's the theme of this class. It's taken this long for you guys to learn the theme of this class, right? It's as if, I know, it sounds nerdy for me to say it. It's as if today you were handed the lightsaber, right? Prior to today, all we did is practice somersaults and dodging and that kind of stuff. Today, you got handed the lightsaber because the mole is the most important thing in chemistry. It is all of our conversions. And now we see two of them, two of many. Let's try an example. That says the same thing as what I just talked about. I'll leave that slide up for a moment if you need it. If you don't like Star Wars, I don't blame you. The newest Star Wars movies, I didn't think they were very good, um, especially compared to the things that are out now. To me, the best... Hands down, I mean, this is my opinion of all of the modern type adventure movies like this is Deadpool. I'll pick that one. And I don't think that any of these sci-fi movies hold a candle to some of those Marvel movies, but especially I think Deadpool's the best. But maybe that's because I have a crush on Ryan, Ryan Reynolds. I don't know. And last example from the first section. We know how to find the mass of individual atoms by going to our periodic table. Does that mean then we can also figure out the mass of compounds and substances? Absolutely, absolutely. Very important thing that we're learning how to do right now. Finding the molar mass of a substance is very important thing. How you do it, I don't care because this kind of stuff, I don't ask you to show your work. The AP test never asks students to do this. They always give it. They always say, da 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 da, water with a molar mass of 18 grams per mole. Da 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 da, sodium chloride with a molar mass of 58.5 grams per mole. They don't even bother asking you to do this. They consider it like baby steps that we wouldn't even waste our time with. But that's where we're at, right? This is the first time we've been handed a lightsaber. We've got to learn how to swing this thing around. I right? gotta learn how to turn it on. You gotta learn all of that different kind of thing. So we have to start with this, but I'm not gonna require you to show your work on these problems. We're gonna use these as intermediate steps, but you need to know how to do the intermediate steps. So here's how I do it. 
this is just the way a, a chemistry teacher somewhere along the line taught me is I do it kind of like a table. Um, there's two hydrogens in a water molecule, right? If you go to your periodic table, on the periodic table, each one of those hydrogens has a mass of 1.0. So two times one adds up to 2.0. In a water molecule, there's one oxygen. On the periodic table, it says 16 grams per mole. Well, one times 16 is 16. Add those two numbers together and you end up with 18 grams per mole. That's the molar mass of water. Traditionally, this chapter would have taken place at the beginning of October. And then we would be going to October 23rd and we would be toasting, <clears throat> sorry, I'm getting choked up when I think about it. We would be toasting to chemistry's holiday with a very small Dixie cup glass full of water and saying happy birthday chemistry because on at 6.02 a.m. or p.m. on October 23rd, we celebrate mole day. And we do it by having 18 grams of water because that's one mole of water. Just getting nerdier and nerdier in here, huh? You guys have been looking at me all semester going, boy, that long haired guy, I bet he's pretty cool. And now you're like, ah, he's just a big nerd. That's okay, there's nothing wrong with being a nerd. Second one. 1NA, go to your periodic table. It's going to say 23.0. Uh, 1 times 23 is 23. You wouldn't even really need to do that. 1 chlorine, go to your periodic table. 35.5. 1 times 35.5 is 35.5. Add those two numbers together. 58.5 grams per mole. I know you're sitting there going, how did he know those numbers? because we use those ones so often, they just become part of my memory. Now, magnesium phosphate, I have no idea. I'm gonna to go to the answer slide for that one, okay? But some things we use them so often, it's just like, it's just easier to memorize them. All right, magnesium phosphate. Count up your magnesiums, I see three. Hey, is anybody looking at this going, Dang, I wish I would have learned how to do chemical formulas better. I wish I wouldn't have just copied his chapter nine worksheet. I should have done it myself, shouldn't I? Yeah, see, now you're going to have to repent of your sins. Because what happens when I just write down a problem and it just says the name magnesium phosphate and you've got to come up with chemical formula. Ding, you just lost some points on this question, huh? So each step of chemistry from now on requires a step before it. So please do not... Uh, slack on chapter 10 because chapter 12 is built on chapter 10 and 11 coming together and colliding. So you've got to get these steps. Chapter 10 has a few steps that require chapter nine, All right? Three magnesiums at periodic table says 24.3 equals ugh, 60, 72, 72.9. Then inside of this, we have two phosphates. Each one of those phosphates contains one phosphorus. So there's two P's, two phosphorus, phosphori at 31.0 is 62.0. And then can you all see that there are eight oxygens at 16 each? Now you can see why I do this little tabular format for adding these up less likely to make a mistake, but I don't know what eight times 16 is. Calculator says 128. Take those three numbers and add them together. I take my shoes off to count this one. Let's see, eight, nine, 10, 16, carry the one, 262.9 grams per mole. Mr. Purser, do we have to round everything to the 10th place? I'd appreciate it, but you don't have to. You can round wherever you want, but round correctly. Because if you start getting too far off, I will start taking off points. Now, that was day one's assignment. Now we're on to day two. Can I go forward? Yell at me in the chat if you don't want me to go forward. Or show your picture. Say, wait. Can't believe not one of you. Just me. I'm the only one. Andrea kinda, at least Andrea puts a picture of herself. I think it's herself, Andrea. I don't even know if that's you. Could be somebody else. Could be your best friend. Ooh, 
lots of really good slides online on this. And when you're looking at those slides and then you go to look at the homework assignment, you're gonna see that's only half there. All of the questions are there, but only half of the answers. Guess which half I'll be looking at specifically to see if they're done and out. Day two, I think it's just these three examples. Yeah, slide 12, 13. We do three, these three examples and then we're out of here. Oh, then we talk about the test if you want to, but you can leave if you want to leave. How many grams in 7.2 moles of dinitrogen trioxide? There's real no, really no reason for me to start yet because I know that you're going to copy down all three examples before uh, we start one, number one. So I'll give you that time to do that. I guess while you're copying this down, since I will lose some of you in a few minutes when you decide not to stay for the um, going over the test, um, I, I have not sent out an extra credit assignment yet. I am planning on sending out a uh, two things to you. One is the study guide for the final that's required like normal as an assignment. And the other is an extra credit study guide. Um, the extra credit study guide will be due uh, by your class period right after Thanksgiving break. So for you, it will be due Monday by 1140. If I get it at 1141, I cut the extra credit down to a minimum. So it's due by 1140. So don't start it on Monday. Start it a week early. Um, if you tell me that it didn't send to me because it, your internet's slow, then I'm going to say then you should have sent it to me two days ago. All right. So don't wait. You're going to send it to me. I'm going to look it over. Yes, I'll talk about finals in a minute. Then um, you, I will uh, set up a couple times for review for the uh, for that study guide extra credit. You have to attend it. When you attend it, um, I'm expecting you to have your video on because I want to see your face. I want to know that you're watching me watch you go as I go over the review. Because if you're just like this right now, I don't know that anybody's actually watching me right now. I'm going to guess Nick is because of the fact he just asked me about final schedule in the midst of me talking about final exams. But otherwise, I don't know if any of you are even sitting where you are right now. You could have left and are sitting eating lunch right now watching TV and you're waiting until you see my face stop moving in front of the camera and then you're going to uh, and then you're going to go over and close it. Right. So you'll have to show me that you're there for that extra credit in order to maximize your extra credit. And then that way we can throw some points back at you, okay? Because I know a few of you are a little bit kind of, right now you're a little bit hurt inside because you wish your test score was better than it was. And you you recognize it's your fault, whatever happened that caused your, you to not work as hard as you should have in chapter six and nine, and you're looking for some repentance. So since chapter six and nine will be on the final anyway, we can practice that as part of our study guide. But I still got to write it because the only one I have right now is good to, good to know that generally I figured you too. Um, good. Um, that I don't even know what I was saying at this point for that now. We're going to review for the final extra credit. You want to get your grade up because you're, you're a little bit hurt and you want uh, something that can make up for it. So that would be the kind of thing that we'd be looking at. So anyway, that was enough time for you to finish writing down those questions. I can get started. All right, good students look at a problem like this and go, feels like a math problem. Yenily's like, I love math. So to me, I love this section of chemistry. Finally, get to do some math. All right, so all students that feel like this is a math question should immediately start by drawing a conversion table line and then find a question. How many grams? You can put a question mark if you want to. Grams equals question mark. I just leave a space there. That's kind of an implied question, okay? Then dinitrogen trioxide, that was probably on somebody's form of the test. 
N2, O3. So that's what we want to get to. What are we going to do now? We're going to start with whatever number they gave us. The measurement given is 7.02, 7.20 moles of N2O7. And now we got to get from moles to grams. So Zen with conversion tables. If there's something that you don't like, you put it in the denominator to get rid of it. Your answer units, you put that in the numerator to get it. So now we need a conversion between grams and moles. That's what molar mass is. Molar mass is where we do what we just did in the last section. We say two nitrogens at 14 each, according to the periodic table, is 28. Three oxygens at 16 each adds up to 48. Add those together, 60, 76. Nick, I didn't answer your question. Uh, we do have a final schedule. <coughs> the, you can look at my calendar and the day that I put is your final, is when your final is, and it's at normal time. Um, because it's trioxide, yes. That's why we put three O's. Um, your final, Your, I'm sorry, your final is at normal time. It's at 1140 on the day that I wrote there for your final. And it's hour and a half long. Uh, I, yeah, that's a good question. Somebody asked me, they put it private, so maybe they don't want the rest of you to recognize that they caught something that's intelligent that is my mistake. I put N207. I meant to put N203, sorry. Yes, trioxide, not, not uh, heptoxide. Thank you. And that's why right here are three, okay? All right, so now that we know the number of grams per mole, we now have something we can use as a conversion. Now, what this says is 76 grams for every one mole. So therefore, if I put the grams on top, the 76.0 has to follow the grams unit to the top of the conversion table line per one mole. In fact, one thing you're gonna notice about chapter 10 is the conversion table steps that involve moles are always per one mole. They're never per some other number of moles. It's always a one that goes with the moles in the second step of the conversion table. And the third step, which we haven't learned yet. That's next time. Now we do the math. My calculator said 547. That was fun, let's do another one. How many grams are 3.41 moles of calcium oxide? Okay, feels like a math question. Makes me wanna put a big conversion table line. Find a money question in the math question. How many grams? Calcium oxide, uh-oh, chapter nine again. Calcium comes from column two, that's a plus two charge. Oxygen comes from column 16, that's a minus two charge. Crisscross those oxidation numbers and so far you have Ca2O2, but we all know that you're supposed to reduce that down to CaO. Now is when that matters, but not yet. It doesn't matter yet. Because right now it's just grams of CaO, okay? We have a number, 3.41 moles, CaO. All people that are Zen with conversion tables know that if you want to get rid of a unit found on the top of a conversion table, put it at the bottom of a conversion table. Mr. Purser, is there ever a time when something's found at the bottom of a conversion table and you have to get rid of it by putting it on top? Yeah, but that's second semester. So why would we worry about that now, right? For now, it's just get out of moles by putting moles in the bottom and then get into grams by putting grams at the top. Here is why you had to reduce because if one mole of calcium oxide is one calcium and one oxygen, when you go and do your one calcium at something around 40, 40.1, and one oxygen at 16.0. If you hadn't reduced that, you wouldn't have 56.1 grams per mole. You'd have 112.2 grams per mole, which would give you too big of an answer that wasn't right. So therefore, that's why we have to reduce. The grams are on top. The 56.1 follows the grams to the top of this. 
Moles go on the bottom. I'm sorry, on the first one, I didn't show the moles canceling out the moles and grams are the unit that are left over. Moles cancel out moles and grams are the units that are left over. Multiply those two numbers and my calculator said 191. Last problem. <coughs> Excuse me. Last problem, then we're all done. Look at that. Sad to see those go. Find the number of moles in 92.81 grams of iron oxide, iron three oxide. Ugh. I know. Did you hear that sound just come out of me? Ugh. That's the sound of me describing you giving me iron oxide on your test. But by the way, if you mess this up on this chapter test, it's small potatoes. This chapter is not about you chemical formula writing. Plus also, you'll probably only have it like on one problem. Everything else, the chemical formula will be given. But if you get it wrong on, the, on this chapter and work out the problem with the wrong substance, that's minimal points lost because that's not what the point of this chapter is. Feels like a math problem. Conversion table line, find a question. Moles of iron oxide. What is iron oxide? That Roman numeral three doesn't mean that we put a three there like some of you did. That Roman numeral three is telling us that this iron has a charge of three plus three. Oxygen, always negative two, crisscross those oxidation numbers and you get Fe2O3. So Fe2O3. Take the number that they gave us and let's put that as the first step. 92.81 grams of Fe2O3. Oh, and by the way, I don't really talk about these downward lines. These just separate the steps, right? Anything that's occurring, like across here, is being multiplied, multiplied, multiplied. Anything that's occurring across the bottom of this is being divided by, divided by, divided by. So I didn't really talk about that. But that's not as important today as it will be next time we meet. But you should know that, you know, top is multiplied, bottom is divided. All right. Good Zen chemistry students know, get out of grams by putting them in the bottom, get into moles by putting it in the top. Now we need a conversion. The conversion to grams and moles requires us to go to our periodic table. So yes, you're gonna need your periodic table tonight. Now you could Google these. I can't stop you from doing that. And I'm not even gonna grade that you show me the work on it until I tell you that I'm gonna grade for showing the work on it. But already in my mind, I don't think I'm going to. So if you Google what Fe203 is, I do it, right? Why would I waste the time to write this out? Well, I'm not new at this. At some point in time, I had to do this by hand, partly because there was no Google. 55.8, 110, 111.6. I remember when I was a sophomore in college. A buddy of mine from high school was studying to be an engineer at Cal State Northridge. And he had a job working for JPL as an, in, as an intern. And he met a girl from Columbia University who was being an intern there for the summer. And they had a summer romance. And after the summer was over, I said, hey man, sorry about you. And I don't remember what her name was. And he said, oh, we keep in contact. We email each other. And I was like, what? You do what? Yeah, this thing called electronic mail. I said, you should try it sometime. Crazy, huh? Now my mom Facebooks. How different is the world? An 84-year-old woman is Facebooking and a 21-year-old boy had no idea what an email was. 59.6 grams per mole. Why did we need to do three examples? Well, we might not have needed three, but we definitely needed this third one because the first two did the same thing. The first two put the number on the top. This last one, the number follows the grams. If you put the grams in the denominator, your number 159.6 has to go in the denominator per one mole. So now instead of multiplying the two numbers, we're dividing. My calculator said, 0.5815. Notice four significant digits because of four significant digits. Three significant digits, three significant digits. 
Thank you for your attention. Chapter 10, homework number two. So you have two assignments tonight. So basically you're doing one through nine. There are multiple parts, so it's not gonna be, you know, just nine, but they're not that hard. So you'll get through them quick. I am gonna turn off the sharing for a moment so I can close the recording and close this assignment. And then I'm gonna open up the practice test that I sent you and just explain to you how I graded. And then you can look at your own score and think what, and you could actually grade yourself. So if you wanna open up your test right now and put scores by it, and let's see how they compare. If you think that I didn't give you enough points, you might protest, okay? I do not take that personally. If you protest your score, good for you. You let me know what you think I should have given you more points on and we will consider it. But I'm gonna close this now.